My name is Jagdish. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce the speaker today, Dr. Mahesh Rangarajan, who's a professor of history and environmental studies, Ashoka University in Haryana. Dr. Rangarajan was educated at the universities of Delhi and Oxford. He has taught at the universities of Cornell, Jadavpur, Delhi, and Kriya more recently. He has been the director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library and served as the vice chancellor of Kriya University. In 2010, Dr. Rangarajan chaired the Elephant Task Force of the Government of India. His first book, Fencing the Forest, was published in 1996 by OUP. Other works include India's Wildlife History, 2001, edited works, Oxford History of Indian Wildlife in 1999, and Environmental Issues in India, 2007. His co-edited works include Battles Over Nature, 2003, Making Conservation Work, 2007, Environmental History as if Nature Existed in 2010, Shifting Ground 2014, Nature Without Borders in 2014, and At Nature's Edge 2018. Dr. Mahesh Rangarajan, interest in nature and wildlife started very early as a founder member of the Environmental Action Group started by students in Delhi in the mid-70s. And he has been rooted in this larger world of nature, wildlife, through the lens of a historian, but he has also kept a pretty close watch on how individuals and institutions and organizations in the country have engaged with conservation. And his knowledge of their work and scholarship, uh, including what they have struggled with, uh, is remarkable. And so, uh, in some sense, in any ecological or wildlife institution across the country and in other parts of the world, Dr. Mahesh Rangajan's name is very well known. So it's my pleasure and privilege. Welcome, Mahesh. Very refreshing to see so many of you here on a very nice evening now that the uh, tailwind of the cyclone has gone and we're back to Bangalore as it normally is in December. Uh, it's very striking that when one looks at the idea of reshaping nature's future, it is something which seems so very topical. Think of the last few weeks and what has occupied time in the social media or in the media at large, or in public debate. Uh, as was done with substantial fanfare, the first cheetahs were back in the central Indian forest in a very long time. It's over 75 years since the last cheetah was shot. The last record of a cheetah seen, perhaps feral, was in the late 60s. Uh, today, the Deccan Herald has a very interesting, uh, very serious editorial. Uh, with a somewhat flippant title. It talks about Jumbo's running astray. And Jumbo, as you know, never existed. Jumbo was the name of a character, and it was given to uh, an elephant who was in a zoo in England. But it was referring to the raising of compense, you know, recompense for loss of life or property uh, uh, because of elephants in Karnataka. There's also constant news about floods and the devastation of floods, not only in India, but in the neighborhood. In the recent few weeks, uh, a very large part of Pakistan, not less than one-fifth, it's a very large country, Pakistan, seventh largest in the world, was underwater uh, because of uh, extremely heavy rains and floods along the basin of the Indus, which covers, by the way, much of Pakistan. There's also a major debate about alternatives in energy. And the last few weeks, I was struck by this because I was teaching in the National Center for Biological Sciences, and one tends to forget it's part of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So each of these has echoes with what happened in the past. Uh, nobody has introduced cheetahs into the wild. At least there is no proven documentary record, though there have been claims. But uh, in the 1920s, just 100 years ago, and starting as early as 1910, the rulers of Gwalior tried to introduce lions from Africa to breed them for hunting. They succeeded, but the lions became a threat to human life. Many dispersed and they were shot. And interestingly, they were released in the same region, the same large forest tract where the cheetahs have been brought. When one looks at compensation for loss of life due to wild animals, perhaps one of the first schemes was started over 120 years ago by the Nawabs of Junagadh, who were protecting the lions of the Gir forest not because they wanted to save them from extinction, they did, but not just because of that, but because they wanted the lions to be protected as trophy animals. But they gave out compensation to the Maldharis of the Gir forest 
who would otherwise have retaliated against lions for loss of livestock. So these issues of re-naturing the wild, trying to transform the forest, the wetland, the savanna, to fit certain agendas of the rulers of the rule, of dominant or dominated groups, of elite or if you like subaltern communities, is not a new venture. It has a longer history. Similarly, the remaking of nature, applying technology, drawing on science, is also not new. I referred to the uh, establishment of TIFR in Mumbai in the 1940s, but given where we are, I must refer to the Krishna Rajasagara Dam in the 1920s and the role of Vishweswaraya. You know, Vishweswaraya had a very famous pamphlet, which I'm sure even those who haven't read it will know its title, and those who don't will not forget it. It was in those days a very unusual pamphlet. It had an exclamation mark at the end. Now, in the 1930s, very few people wrote books with exclamation marks at the end. They were born about 90 years too late. Today, uh, all, many things you see have exclamation marks. It was called Industrialize or Perish. And what Vishweshraya was referring to, in a sense, frames the larger question of reshaping nature's future in independent India. By the 1920s and 30s, there was a major debate in India about what the meaning of freedom would be. Even those who agreed that India ought to be politically free, independent, a country that was not under foreign rule, a country that would either be a self-governing nation within the larger commonwealth or an independent republic, and it became both, what would be the path that it would take? One reason for this is that the period from the late 19th century till the 1930s was a period of great upheaval. We think of it as a period of wars. We think of it as a period of political transformation. We think of it as a period of social change. But it was also a period of great demographic and environmental upheaval. There's a lot of work being done on the loss of deaths due to the famines and the pandemics, important word, pandemics, between the 1890s and the 1940s. 1899-1900, uh, rains failed for two consecutive years, for instance, in Western India. And the Gir Forest, which I referred to, because I think it's useful to illustrate with a particular example, it was the year of the Vikram Sambhat Chappan, you know, 56. It's still recalled in Saurashtra as the year of the Chappani Okal, the famine of, of 2056. And these famines had a particularly deleterious impact, not just on human livelihood, but on life. And there's a lot of work being shown to show that the excess mortality in these famines was also driven by revenue policy and by the belief of the government that you should not interfere with market forces. The most horrific of these, of course, was the Bengal famine in 1943, in which not less than three and perhaps six million people lost their lives. It took place during a bumper harvest. I say this because the India of 1947 was about 80% dependent on agriculture. And agricultural growth rate in the 50 years before independence was somewhere between 0 and 0.5%. So the coming of independence to India came after a period of great demographic upheaval. We think of population growth as typifying the 20th century. But in the years to 1921, the 50 years, in 1871, the British had uh, a census, you know. The 2021 is the first time we have not had a census in 150 years. Hopefully there will be a census soon. And one of the pluses with the census is that it gives you a sense of the rate of population growth. Before that, nobody had counted how many people were there in the whole of India, ever. And the rate of population growth up to 1921 is 0.5%. The growth of population really is in 1920s on phenomenon. So India becomes independent at a time when population growth is beginning to expand. The, the rate of growth of population is stepping up. And by the 1970s, it gets to 2.14% a year. But food production did not keep pace. The other point, of course, is that the coming of the Second World War in 1939 had a deep economic impact and an environmental impact on South Asia as a whole. The India of 1947 included the present territories of the Union of India, as well as Pakistan and Bangladesh. 
until 1937, it also included Burma. It's about 4 million square kilometers. It is the largest single possession that the British had in their worldwide empire. And it was a possession which was very crucial in the Second World War. Over 2 million Indians fought in the war. What is often not realized, since I work a lot on animal history, I have to talk about non-human animals. You know, humans are animals too. We are two-legged primates. We shouldn't ever forget that. Bipedal primates. A very particular, special variety, aren't we? But this war also in entailed over 3,000 elephants captured from the forests of India and Burma, which were deployed in Southeast Asia. And this vast army was paid for out of Indian revenues. Justice had been done through the years of the East India Company polity and British rule in India. So India was a supplier of military labor, human and animal, both in the First and Second World Wars. Large numbers of animals for India were recruited for the war. Uh, you know, one of the animals which people used to make fun of, and I hate to say this in the 70s, 80s, in North India, were very important in armies. One was the donkey. The other was the mule. And if you thought somebody was very foolish, you said gadha. And if you thought they were very uh, stubborn, you said khachar, you know, to be mulish. But donkeys and mules and horses, by the way, were very important in warfare right till the 1920s and 40s. So India's independence in 1947 came after a time of great upheaval. The war also entailed government mobilizing food resources for the war effort. I referred to the famine in Bengal. And that famine was a result of British policy. It came in a year of a bumper harvest. The remarkable film by Ritwik Ghatak, Akaler Sandhaner, The Sound of Famine. And even those who don't follow Bengali, I urge you to see the first 10 minutes of the film because they are counterintuitive. They show a beautiful, lush East Bengal landscape. There's paddy about to ripen in the fields. There's a lovely shot of a butterfly. I don't know which species. It lands and it flits about and birds are singing. And it reminds you that this famine happened in a year of bumper harvest. Bumper harvest in Bengal, also bumper harvest in Punjab. People were so poor they couldn't buy grain. But the grain was mobilized for the war effort. There's a similar famine incidentally in Travancore where one and a half million people died. Srinath Raghavan, professor at Ashoka, is one of the very few who has opened the door to studying that famine. So this slogan, industrialize or perish, had a very particular salience and significance in the India of the 30s and 40s. In the great debate within the Congress, the party which came to rule India after independence, there was a consensus by the 30s of those who were active in the party that there was no alternative to secure political independence without the artifices of a modern economy. One of the remarkable things about India is that any idea which is expressed by anyone, it is possible to argue, as John Robinson said in another context, that the exact opposite is also true. So, there's a counter to Vishweswaraya written by J.C. Kumarappa, a chartered accountant from Tamil Nadu who abandoned his practice, put on khadi and became a Gandhi. Kumarappa is a remarkable figure and uh, there's a book by uh, Professor Govindu of the Indian Institute of Science, which he's co-authored on the life and work of Kumarappa. Kumarappa wanted a politically independent India. He wanted an economically self-reliant India. He took Gandhiji's ideas of a self-reliant village economy, took them further, and argued in exact contra contrast to Vishweswaraya, industrialize and perish. You can't find two titles with two diametrically opposite times written by two such remarkable men in such a short span of space. Kumarappa's argument was that this idea of self-reliance should be applied not to the nation, the nation-state, but to the village. And as you may anticipate, it was a mix of handicrafts, agriculture, recycling organic residues, and so on and so forth. Predictably, Kumarappa worked with the Khadi Village Industries Commission after independence. Equally predictably, he found it becoming a very bureaucratic body, and he moved on. But by the 1930s and 40s, the ideas of the sort invinced by Komarappa were marginal to the national movement. They were not marginal in the sense that people didn't believe in them. There were many believers, there were many practitioners. The Gandhian self-work tradition, constructive tradition remains important in India even today. But these were not central to the debates about what was to be done. 
And one of the very interesting articulations of why was made uh, by scientists who argued that you could not get a modern economy without three fundamentals, nitrogenous fertilizer, iron and steel, and plentiful power. If you look around this room, we may understand why. Though you won't see nitrogenous fertilizer here, but it's probable that whatever we all ate for lunch or dinner or breakfast was fertilized using uh, nitrogenous fertilizer. Without power, we wouldn't be able to see each other in this otherwise dark room. And of course, steel and various metal implements are very crucial in building a modern economy. Dr. Meghnath Saha was the person who articulated these views. So I think that in the late 1930s, from around the onset of the Second World War, the British also come around to the idea that India does need to have the rudiments of an industrial economy. It's for warlike reasons. They saw India as fundamental to their imperial efforts. Many of the large companies which would shape India in the early years after independence, Tata and Birla, to name just two, made great fortunes during these wars because they were suppliers. But they also laid the foundations of the rudiments of a modern economy. And so the India of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, the notion of the planned economy actually won a lot of support from Indian industry. And I want to emphasize from a large section of the scientific intelligentsia. Now, we live at a time when it's fashionable to think we can escape from the past. We think that if we rewrite history in some way, not me, not you, but enough people from across the spectrum, I'm not referring to any particular group or ideology. And one of the interesting things is to see the early years of independence where they got virtually everything wrong. Now, this may or may not be the case. As you can see, if you are inclined towards industrialized or perish, and if you're inclined to industrialize and perish, you can always find fault with what happened. But it's crucial to keep in mind that our study and understanding of the past must be informed by a sense of context. It's easy to say someone went wrong with something 10, 40, 60, or 70 years ago, but they didn't have the benefit of hindsight. They lived and worked in a very different world from our own. I once got into a very interesting argument with a little girl about 15 years ago, and you'll love this conversation. She told me that you're actually very old. Now, I don't know if that's true, but, but, the, but the line of debate was fascinating. She asked me, when you were young, did you have cheese slices? Did you have color television? Did you have the internet? Had you seen a cell phone? Did you know what a computer was? And when I said no to everything, I was told that I was very old because I'd lived in the olden times. Well. In the 1950s and 1940s, barely 15% of the land in India was under irrigation compared to 60 now. The lifespan, the male lifespan was 32 years. It's 68 now. The number of people living in towns was about 12 to 14%. India was a very different country in the 1940s and 50s. It was the first major country in Asia, Africa to emerge from the ruins of empire. And have no doubt, the empire was in ruins. At the end of the Second World War, Britain and France were defeated countries. Their victory was enabled by the Soviet Union and, of course, by the United States. And India chose not to join either camp. The coming of independence in India in 1947 coincided with the onset of the Cold War, the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine. The world, which had been divided into two armored camps, the fascists and their opponents, was now again divided into two armored camps. Depending on your politics, the capitalists and communists, the democrats and the one-party wallas. And India chose, most interestingly, not to join either. This is very crucial because this quest for creating the artifices of economic growth had to proceed in a country which was not in either camp. So we today are in a world where we often compare India to China. China, after 1949, for the first 15 years, had unstinted support from the Soviet Union, because it is part of the Soviet camp. And the Indian road, we must emphasize, while we did not join the American camp, was a democratic road. In 1950, India embarked on something nobody had ever attempted, adopting a democratic constitution in an Asian country, with a population equal to the size of Western Europe. In one of his books, Professor Ram Guha calls the 1952 election the greatest gamble in history. 
Ornit Shani shows 70% of the people who voted in the 1952 election or had the right to vote had never voted in their lives. Women, the scheduled castes, the scheduled tribes, many people without property or literacy, they were given, their identification was done, believe it or not, by September 1949. If you want to know how, you have to read Ornit Shani's book. But let me come to the environmental dimension. I think the reshaping of nature is very crucial to the project of the nation state. All nations argue that they are products of a long history. The newly independent country adopted a wonderful anthem written by the great Rabindranath Tagore, the only man who has written the anthems in Asia of not one, but two countries. The other was Bangladesh to be born in 1972. Since we are in an era when Netaji Subhash Bose is rightly and justifiably popular, I urge those who don't know Bangla to hear the INA version of the song. It's sung in Hindustani, it's much longer, and it says Jaya Ho, not Jaya He. But common to both these songs is an invocation, not just to history, but to geography. They speak of the Vindhya, Himachal, the Jamuna, and Ganga. So there's something very interesting going on here. This is a new nation state. It's drawing on cultural symbols and markers, but it's drawing on the mountains, the rivers, the notion that this Tiranga flutters under the sky in this particular land. It's drawing on a very old idea of India being a country, or a, or a land rather, which is bounded by the Himalayas to the north and the seas to the east, west and south. And the challenge, of course, was not just crafting a political system, but creating the basis for economic growth. My colleague uh, P. Balakrishnan has written two remarkable books. And to sum up the first part of the books in one line, the period from 1950 to 65 saw an economic growth rate not of less than 1%, but of 4%. Well, 4% today would be like failing in an exam. You know, we all know what failing is in India. Indian parents, students, they dread failure. As if it's something very wrong. It isn't. Failure is part of life. Even polities fail. But India was a remarkable success in those 15 years. But as one would expect, in that 4%, there was enormous emphasis on the growth of heavy industry. As early as 1949, Jawaharlal Nehru spoke at the inauguration of a dam, or the work on a dam, of Hirakut in the state of Odisha. This was a very interesting project because it would supply abundant power. This power was to be used to smelt bauxite, to make aluminium. Everyone in this room must have flown in a plane or must be knowing someone who's flown in a plane. Well, planes even now and then are made of alloys of aluminium. The problem with aluminium is that to get the, alumin the bauxite to be made into aluminium, you need lots and lots of power. And this power was supplied, please note, to a private sector plant owned by one of the big business houses, I have said. That's the Indian model. It's a private-public partnership. The public investment went into the dam because the hydropower was seen as vital for industrialization. Since we are in South India, I cannot but tell you that aluminium makes something without which no kitchen today is complete. It's called stainless steel. It ain't steel, it's aluminium. But this particular event was marked by something which is very familiar to us today, a black flag demonstration. The members of the Communist Party of India raised black flags and protested. They were protesting the displacement of villages by the reservoir which the dam would create. And uh, they did not disrupt the meeting. The meeting ended, the Prime Minister left. Soon after this, the Deputy Prime Minister, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, wrote a letter to Congress MLAs who had participated in the demonstration. The Communist Party demonstration, Communist Party and Congress Party were at loggerheads, but the Congress MLAs went along because they felt that the grievances were genuine. Patel's letter is fascinating. It said that I completely sympathize with the issues that are being raised by you. There is no question that displacement from your home, from your land, is a great tragedy and challenge for people who lose their land. He then went on to say that he was not unfamiliar with this. He had dealt with the problem of displacement in the 1920s as the mayor of, of Ahmedabad. But that India had now become independent, it was the duty of elected representatives not to stop a development project, but to enable it. And rather than participate in demonstrations, which he said the Congress party would take an extremely serious view, they disciplined members of a large political party after all, one which was entrusted with ruling the country, it was their duty to work for better resettlement of these people. I want to emphasize this because it's often sometimes felt today that some of the issues that big development brought about 
were not at all foreseen by their architects. Let me cite a second, somewhat unusual case. Jawaharlal Nehru's famous speech is often quoted. 1954, he gave two of the most remarkable speeches of his life, one in Bhakra and the other in Nangal, two dams built on uh, the Indus Valley system, the Satlaj and the Bias, number of dams were to be built. These are very important dams. The Bakranangal Dam actually is the largest earth masonry dam of that time. Other than the top builder, who was American, everybody working on it, all the engineers were Indian. Around this time, India decided to build a new capital for Chandigarh, the, for, for Punjab, the modern city of Chandigarh, Al La Corbusier and Albert Mayer were the two experts, a Frenchman and American. Virtually everyone was Indian. This is a very fine institute which ranks with some of our best universities. You will be happy to know that the first set of graduates of the School of Planning and Architecture of Delhi, a lot of them got their jobs in Chandigarh. They are the people who actually designed and built it. So the idea of Bhakra, of Nangal and Chandigarh, was summed up in Nehru's speech. He said that this dam, was larger than the greatest temple, mosque or gurudwara. Now, he was not suggesting that people should not go to these religious temples and sites. What he was trying to say is that this is a common civic endabawa of peaceful civilian construction. And that it was important, doesn't say this, but it's evident, that in a part of India which had been marked by the bloodshed, the horror, the refugees of partition, it was time to come together and build something anew. The audience he had, not only in Punjab, but in India, would have caught on to this because, as is well known, huge investments had been made for over a century by the British in the Punjab for irrigation. The canal colonies of the Punjab gave what is now Pakistan the highest per capita irrigated area on earth of any nation, but all of them were lost to the new union of India. So the Bhakra and Dangal dams, besides power, was supposed to assure perennial supply of water to the North Indian plain. And this was very critical in the agricultural transformation which would follow in Punjab and Haryana in the subsequent years. But in 1957, Nehru did something more interesting. Uh, every month he wrote letters to chief ministers. On 15th August 1957, note the date, 10 years after independence, it's a very interesting letter which uh, has been overlooked by most uh, students of history. Sometimes you overlook evidence. You think you know what you're looking at, and then you go and look at it again, and you realize you ought not to have looked at it, but studied it. He wrote that it has been our failing to look at big dams from a purely engineering point of view. There was a new science, he said, called the oeconomy of nature. This is what we call ecology now. Oeconomy is very strange spelling. It's economy with an O in front. Oeconomy, I don't know how you pronounce it. And that according to this science, you had to study the impact of a large project on the flora, fauna, soil, and water of a region. And that in the future, he hoped such studies would be done. The subsequent letter went on to say that it is necessary to study the problem of resention of glaciers in the Himalayas because of changes in the nature of the atmosphere worldwide. And for those of you interested in animals, the rest of this letter, 15 September 1957, one month later, goes on to talk about how there is scientific research to show that exotic animals should not be introduced into uh, ecological systems. And there are two paragraphs on the horrors of the rabbits in Australia. Now, I don't know what the chief ministers did with the letters. I'm sure they all read them. Most of them from Congress party, except for Nambudripad in Kerala. And he was soon to lose his job. He just got elected in 57. But, but what I want to emphasize is that these debates did exist at the time. They were much clearer with an even larger project in the imagination of people from Eastern India, the Damodar Valley. The Damodar Valley project had two very interesting proponents. Meghnath Saha, nowadays it's not popular, uh, or rather it is popular in digital form. There were comics called the Amar Chitrakatha. They were supposed to tell you about Indian history in these, uh, you know, 30 page with lots of uh, uh, colorful drawings and dialogues. There's one on Meghnath Saha. And for once they've got it right. The first two pages are about Meghnath Saha living in the Damodar Valley Basin and experiencing firsthand. He came from a poor family. He came from a community or class which was at the certainly not among the elite groups in, in Bengal society. And he was someone who talked about the importance of floods when he was a physicist in Presidency College uh, in the pre-independence years. He's a very important physicist. 
Damodar Valley had a champion in someone whose statues have sprouted up all over India in the last 30 years, and rightly so, Dr. Ambedkar, where he was in the Viceroy's Council as Labour member, he helped set up the Damodar Valley Corporation. And the Damodar Valley Corporation was seen just as the Tennessee Valley Corporation was in the United States as a series of dams which would not only stop the floods but generate power and transform a region from a backward to an industrialized and modern uh, economy. Many of these hopes, of course, were not entirely realized. But it's still significant to note that in the 1950s, India was a country which was trying to combine democracy and development. This is not the route most countries in Asia and Africa took, which got unified or independent in the subsequent 10 or 20 years. The other point is that while there was enormous emphasis on growth, this also came at a cost. Nowhere is this more evident, not looking at water now, but at forests, than with reference to the forest wealth and the uncultivated land. One of the Indians who went on to become president of India was V. V. Giri. And V. V. Giri in the 1940s was a militant labor union leader. And that was a time when leaders didn't just lead, they wrote. They also read because they spent time in prison. And it, history shows prison is an excellent place for school. People write books. And one of the books he wrote, was about how India had to provide food for the millions. And he actually suggested that virtually all the land area of India must be brought under cultivation. Actually, a very bad idea. Many areas are marginal. They're better left uncultivated for a variety of reasons. But Vivigiri was speaking in the spirit of his times. During the Second World War, government of India launched huge Gromo food campaigns. The British government, turned its back on decades of policy of not distributing guns to Indians and gave out free guns where they were crop raiding ungulates and encouraged the cultivators to shoot the Nilgai, wild boars, sambar and all these creatures. In the 40s, there was another revolution. It was worldwide. It had a name. It was called DDT, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. For those of us who found chemistry difficult, and I admit I did, it's a petrochemical product. It was used widely in the war in the form of dust for soldiers. But now it was mixed with oil and along with new antimalarial drugs and the refugees who came in after partition, who lost home and hearth, it helped open up and settle the Tarai in India, both in the west and the, no and the northeast and across Nepal. So this huge clearing of the Tarai, a very important ecological watershed, unfolds in the years after independence. This huge assault, because it was an assault, was not only on wetlands and grasslands, but also on forests across, because forests were seen as vital, as raw material. Now, one of the indices of development, not so in the internet age, but definitely so, and even now it's not gone, is not how much food people eat, but how much paper they consume. And India, in the 1940s and 50s, devised ways to subsidize the production of paper. So, the forest policy of 1952 allocated raw material to pulp, paper, and several other such heavy industries because these also were seen as vital for development. This came at a cost. It came at the cost of those reliant on the forest. It came at the cost of the various ecologies of the forest. If you look at large forest areas of northeast as well as southern India, dipterocarp trees, because you can't make paper only with bamboo, you need hardwoods, would disappear because it was cheaper it was more profitable to cut them at the subsidized rate and supply them to paper mill than to let them stand in the forest. This transformation, therefore, was a very significant one. And the idea of the domination of nature gained much more currency than had been the case earlier. We again need to look at this in the context of its times. In 1950s, the premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, launched the Virgin Land Scheme. It was to end in disastrous failure to take over huge areas of fallow lands in Russia and Ukraine. He was a Ukrainian Russian. And many years later, this entire scheme collapsed because these lands were not productive and fertile enough to support these crops. A year later, 1958, around the time Nehru was writing those letters, 1957-58, Chairman Mao Ryan launched the Great Leap Forward, uh, saying that we should grow grain on the tops of mountains and the bottoms of lakes. It led to one of the worst famines in human history. Not less than 30 million people died. And it included something remarkable, a war on the sparrow. China set out to exterminate the sparrow. Fortunately, they failed. After some time, they realized that the young sparrows eat up a lot of insects. And whatever grain the adult sparrows eat is more than canceled out by the baby sparrows and insects. But by then, they'd managed to kill a lot of sparrows. 
I think the India of the 50s and 60s bore some resemblance to that China, in the sense that shikar, spot hunting, was subsidized by government. It was encouraged. Uh, there's a remarkable book by Jack Nenton Scott called In the Forests of the Night, in which he goes around various forests of India shooting, and he meets a young member of parliament, Vidyacharan Shukla, and he sees a smart young man whose company, Alvin Cooper, organized my shikar in the central provinces. And he says that, uh, I'm glad Shukla has not been eaten up by a tiger because he helped me to bag several, and so on and so forth. So this free-for-all for nature had larger constituency, not just among industry and the middle class, but a land-hungry peasantry. It was seen as vital to take the nation forward, even though it imposed new kinds of ecological costs. These costs were borne, as I said, by forest-dependent peoples. They were also borne by the larger ecological systems. There were corrective measures. I referred to uh, you know, wildlife parks and sanctuaries. These began to be expanded and created. But I think this broad phase comes to an end in the late 1960s. The late 1960s were a time of upheaval and crisis. One of the major upheavals was that there were two years of consecutive rainfall failure. India was short of grain. In 1965 and 66, it saw the death of the second prime minister, the coming in of a young new prime minister, and on her first visit to Washington, as Mrs. Indira Gandhi told Indar Malhotra, her biographer, she didn't know he was going to write a biography, even he didn't, he wrote it 21 years later, but he obviously kept a diary, he didn't write this in his report. In those days, if political leaders spoke off the record, the person actually kept it off the record, they wrote it many years later. Maybe that's not such a bad idea, because what she told him is very interesting. She said, I have to go to Washington because we badly need food aid. I have to secure it while pretending not to ask for it. So it's something very interesting. Here is a country with a very deep sense of national pride. It had to buy, believe it or not, 19 to 20 million tons of grain. For, in two years, one-fifth of the grain wheat product of the United States ended up, if you like, in an Indian chapati or a paratha or a puri. And now, in many parts of India, people had never consumed these uh, items. In many places in southern India, and I have it on good authority, government actually hired uh, cooks, and they would come to the markets and squares, and they would put on these kerosene stoves and give out puris, and they'd give a handbill explaining how to make a puri. And there were big protests in Kerala. You know, the Marxist party uh, won an election for many reasons, but one of their slogans is that we are not here to eat wheat, we want rice. And they promised rice. So this huge reliance on external imports, which the country did not have foreign exchange to pay for, it had to pay in kind under the PL 480 laws, actually gave an enormous impetus to the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is a term used for the induction of high yield varieties, interestingly supplied with the assistance of projects funded by Rockefeller and Ford, both American foundations. Because there was a large body of American opinion which felt that unless the Green Revolution gathered pace, much of Asia would fall prey to a Red Revolution. It's a time when in Vietnam the war was becoming very intense of North and South. China was in upheaval and there was a deep fear, including in many of the Indian leadership, that there would be social unrest, political upheaval in the rural hinterland. The Green Revolution, in, put in a line, was remarkably similar to the earlier policy of emphasizing one sector with heavy investments in one region to drive up production. The idea being that this would spread out benefits over time. Uh, four years after that, or five years in 1972, India again had a drought. It imported around 4 million tons of grain. But as has been shown by many scholars, the expansion of high yielding variety wheat in northwest India, of rice in pockets of southern India, had alleviated India's problem of food self-reliance. It did not abolish hunger, but it definitely helped establish the basis of food self-reliance. Today, looking back, one must emphasize that high-yielding varieties are not restricted to rice or to wheat. They include something which only Indians, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis and Nepalis know, dal, pulses. It includes oil seeds and vegetables and fruits. And the spread of the Green Revolution in the 70s and 80s, particularly into the the heavily irrigated, rainfall-rich areas of the Ganga Basin, East UP, Bihar, Bengal, and Bangladesh would transform the life of several people in these areas. 
as with the transformations of industry, this green revolution came at enormous cost. Because the same factors that enabled rapidly ripening stocks of wheat and rice to give higher seed to yield ratios, hmm? the same factors had far-reaching ecological consequences. The nitrogenous fertilizers leached into the water and caused the eutrophication of lakes and rivers and the sea. Worldwide problem, but of course, this is the time it becomes more acute in India and the rest of South Asia. The use of pesticides uh, brought about new threats uh, to birds, to insects, and of course, to human health, particularly of laborers working in these fields. The uh, transformation was driven, as I said, by high-yielding varieties, but a handful of varieties now replaced a diverse germplasm of cultivars which had been bred for generations with resistance to drought or to pests or with specific capabilities in Osar lands or to alkaline or acidic waters. The other impact of the Green Revolution, of course, is that there was a debate whether it accentuated inequalities of region and of class. Uh, one of the insights we have because of the remarkable work of Prof. Sabina Agawal is that certainly the Green Revolution increased labor availability and job opportunities for women. So it not only drove up wage rates uh, within the Green Revolution zone, it actually created a lot of wage opportunities in terms of weeding and a lot of other ancillary activity for women. This is not very widely known. It opened up agro-processing. But please note, much of the Green Revolution was in rain-fed areas, it was not in dry lands, and its spread was enabled not by big dams, but as Sunil Amrit reminds us in his remarkable work on monsoon Asia, by the spread of something very important to Indian history and politics in the last 50 years, the tube well. So if you look at politics in agrarian India, there are two critical areas which keep coming up. Should farmers get free power or not? It's about tube wells, because the water is coming up from under the ground. And that water has enabled a shift from single to double cropping. It has enabled areas which barely yielded one crop to yield two. More jobs, more production, but at the cost of the groundwater. It's no point blaming the farmer. The price incentive structure makes that logical, but what is economically logical may ecologically be ruinous. Similarly, the spread of tube wells and of irrigated agriculture came with something else which is so ubiquitous that we forget to realize how central it is as a transformative factor in the larger Indian agroecological scene. The replacement of the pack bullock by the tractor. You know, the Congress Party, uh, under Mrs. Gandhi, would win the 1971 elections. And its symbol, I don't know if you, how many people know this, was two bullocks pulling a plow. That was the old India. In 1965, two-thirds of the traction power on the farm came from bullocks. Today, 70% plus comes from tractors. This should not entirely be seen as negative because you can calculate how much fodder and pasture would be required for those bullocks. And we need to keep into account that Indian tractors are smaller than elsewhere. They work on small holdings. They are leased, rented, and hired by several people. So the Green Revolution would see a very different kind of emphasis than the previous period. And interestingly, it had a counterpart, and I'll, I'll end with this without getting into much detail, which is that in the late 60s and early 70s, there was an awakening to the importance of the faunal wealth of India. And it's not a coincidence that the Green Revolution runs roughly parallel to the ex intensification of efforts to save India's vanishing wildlife. The tiger, the rhinoceros, the elephant, the enactment of the Wildlife Protection Act, and the transformation of a large area, about 5% of the landscape, by 2000 into parks and sanctuaries. One of the differences and contrasts of the Green Revolution with forest conservation is that the Green Revolution has rested on an alliance between agricultural sciences, government credit, and private cultivators. Initially large, later medium, and increasingly small farmers. And we can debate whether it should have helped small farmers more, and we should debate uh, why women uh, do not have rights to agricultural land property in practice across much of India. They may have it, of course, because of legal enactments in theory. However, there's a contrast with the forest space. From the 1950s, the kind of transformation of land to the tiller, which happened on the farmland, the cultivated land, hmm, did not take place in the forest lands. 
the large areas of reserved forest and protected forest, which were owned by government, a holdover from the imperial colonial era, actually were expanded and augmented after independence. The abolition of zamindari meant land to the tiller of the cultivated land. There was a very famous film of uh, Balrad Sani, Do Bigha Zameen, which is about, you know, a very, uh, it's a short story of Prem Chand, which was made into a remarkable film. This is an even more remarkable film, which I think is one of the most inspiring films made by the, by the film industry in India, Mother India, which means Nargis plays the mother of two sons. And uh, it's about her trying to stay away from a very avaricious moneylender. It's the struggle simply to make things work. And I'm not going to tell you whether she succeeded or failed, because it's a film really worth seeing, especially the last 10 minutes. And what I want to emphasize is that in the forest, Zamindari forests were brought under government. Malgozari forests were brought under government. Princely states, which covered a third of India, those became government forests. And these government forests were primarily seen as important for industrial raw material, and in some cases, for limited expansion of agriculture. But the question of rights of people who live within the forest, the rights of people who depended on the forest, were not on the political agenda. And they weren't taken up. You'll find a range of political leaders taking them up. One of them, uh, many people are surprised in 1961 in Jabalpur, there was an Adivasi Sammelan, which was addressed by someone who's now become very important in symbolic terms, Dindayal Upadhyay. It's a very interesting speech, because he referred to two things. He referred to the fact that the Adivasis had been victimized by the colonial government, even for meeting their basic needs. Second, he asked, do we really need to ban shifting cultivation, or can we reconcile shifting cultivation with regrowing of tree crops? He referred to the Taungya system. Such debates, of course, were going on inside government, very relevant, famously. Helped formulate the policy of Panchashila. Protect, the first principle of Panchashila said, protect the land and forest rights of the scheduled tribals. This was not done by government itself. Many of the big dams displaced many of these people. But the forest issue, in terms of tenurial rights, was not put on the agenda till as late as 2006 under the Forest Rights Act. It was the first such step. Because in the period of the 60s, 70s and 80s, Curtailment of rights in the uncultivated land was the prime mode of conservation. The Wildlife Protection Act 1972, the Forest Conservation Act 1980 were steps in this direction. They both had very laudable objectives to protect and secure the wildlife, to stop the conversion of forest land to non-forest use, to protect forest cover. But the way in which they did it, the mechanisms that were employed, reinforced the earlier policies of exclusion. Of course, this broad phase of the 60s draws to an end by the end of the 80s. We then enter, uh, enter a territory we are all familiar with, the territory of Reform India. And from around 91, we can debate whether these policies began earlier, they had earlier roots. No major change in history happens in a day. Uh, you know, if one wants to understand it, as Professor Roger Owen famously said about military coups, and you can say this about economic transformations, we have to go to the 10 years of history before. But after the early 90s, from around the early 90s, governments in India, whether at the federal or at the state level, see government not as the major source of investment for growth. They see the private sector as the major source of investment for growth. This is a very major change. It's immaterial who's in power. Those of you who follow the recent events of a port uh, in uh, the state of Kerala, where there is a left of centre government, and it's caught in exactly the same place where several other governments are caught. It sees investment in this port as vital for exports and growth, whereas people who depend on the port, the people living in that area, it's not a not in my backyard theory. This, this, this port will not come up in their backyard. This port will come up in the area which is vital to their livelihood, if not residence. So it's a very particular kind of issue that has come up. And the older structures of protection, of conservation, of environmental repair are increasingly inadequate because the priorities have changed. You can substitute the name for the spot with a highway project, a mine, a township, a dam. It's the same story. So how do you industrialize in a democratic and just, transparent manner in a country where not only are all people voters, all adults, but most people are small producers or are self-employed. This is very crucial. In most of Europe or North America, the majority of the people are in services and industry. 
The population dependent on agriculture in Europe is less than 3% of the labor force. In the United States, it is than 2% of the labor force. Even today in India, it's somewhere between 40 and 50, 45 or 42 percent of the labor force. If you take indirectly driven agriculture, it will be even more. That's one. The second, and this is very crucial, development in the 21st century is distinct from the notion of development in the mid 20th or the late 20th century. Development in the 20th century, and this is broadly agreed upon across the world by leaders of different persuasions and political and cultural and economic stripes in all the conferences in 1972, development has to be without destruction. But who is to define what is development? And what happens when one person's development is another's destruction? Here is something very significant in the Indian case, which needs to be given much more credit than we often give. The Forest Rights Act of 2006, for the first time recognized, rights of people living within a forest as to be ascertained through a law governed process. There are various estimates. One says 3 million individual families have got land title within the forest. But the community forest rights to secure the forest has not been taken up adequately. And yes, many of the ecological critiques that uh, forests may get fragmented, that there ought to be ways to secure their ecological value do have water, but I'm not sure that pushing back the rights is the way to go there. But, but those concerns are very important. This is equally so with land acquisition. In 2013, partly because of very large movements against dams, including the Narmada movement, widely, I would argue, incorrectly, seen as a failure because the dams got built, movements should not be assessed simply whether they succeed in immediate objectives. Recent remarkable oral history edited and compiled by Nandini Oza is worth reading. It's a very moving history. And at the end of it, you realize something that the people who engaged in the struggle against the Narmada dams or for redesign of the dams may have failed. A lot of them may have got resettled. Many of them were displaced. But the issue they put on the map in 2013 resulted in a very major change where the, those who are displaced for the first time have rights. Up to then, they had no rights. And please note, governments, even governments with a majority, single party majority, state and center, who considered whether they should revise this, did not do so because they realized that this issue had support across party political lines. So both the Forest Rights Act, there's a big debate whether it's been diluted recently, some of its provisions have been weakened, and the Resettlement Act, it's got such a long name that I won't even try to, try to inflict it on you, 2013, are reminders that development without destruction is also a question of rights. But what happens when you think of equality and justice for all humans, for all people, particularly in a country and a society where many peoples have for years been deprived of those rights? Historically, one can look at gender, one can look at caste, one can look at tribe, one can look at various forms of exclusion, which are well known in many societies, including in this one, where they often overlap in very, very serious, often grievous ways. But this issue today has to be reconciled with the search for, and that's why I suggested the title, Reshaping Nature's Future, the relationship of ecology, policy, and society. For society to be just, for society to address the issues of inequality, disparity, deprivation in a law-governed and peaceful way is not enough. In today's world, it, we have to address the issue of having a habitable world, of a habitable environment, a safe environment, a productive environment, a biologically productive environment. So one of the advantages of the study of history is that we don't have to give answers, but we can pose questions. And we also have the advantage of saying, we don't know the answers. Actually, nobody knows the answers. But we have to think about the question. And the question would be, how do we have a just society by just means which addresses the problem of nature? The problem of nature defined in terms of a habitable, safe, productive, living and working environment, not only for humans, but for the various elements of nature that enable ecological systems to work. And it is very important in a city with a 500-year-old history of habitation, Bangalore, for someone coming from a city with a 1,000-year-old history of habitation in Delhi, that we also study how peoples have kept these environments habitable, safe, and productive 
over long periods of time. Not because we want to idealize them and romanticize them, but we should be careful that we don't destroy centuries of human ingenuity because of short-term material interest and intellectual blindsidedness. So I will end on this, that the past doesn't give magic silver bullet solutions, but it suggests many ways of looking at the future. And this is both uh, a challenging and an exciting time to live. And this is one of the places which will be very crucial to how the world handles not only the problems of climate change, environmental deterioration, chemical contamination, species decline, oceanic pollution, but this question of how the search for dignity, material and human, has to have a longer view beyond humans to other species, other landscapes, and other waterscapes. Thank you. In conservation, uh, it's quite easy to be a pessimist, but uh, we have seen the writings of, uh, of naturalists and uh, in, say, the 1940s and 50s, where there were predictions of, of and early 60s as well, that by the time that we would reach 2000, the year 2000, we would have none of the large vertebrates uh, left in, in the country, and, uh, and presenting a pretty bleak picture of, of the future. And yet, uh, we have seen that uh, there have been a lot of conservation successes in spite of all the challenges that we have faced. And compared to many other parts of the world, I think that, um, that as far as uh, conservation has been um, overall, we've actually had a fairly interesting and uh, and you would say that we have managed to save many species from the brink, whether it's the Asiatic lion, the tiger, or the ghadial, and, and others, um, in spite of so many other pressures and lack of resources. So um, even now, uh, many conservationists often uh, are pessimists, given the type of projects and that they see as uh, eating into the last remnants of nature in one part of the, of the country or the other. And yet, across uh, Across different states, we have seen um, that in spite of changes in government and parties and so on, you have seen, um, for example, the continued uh, protection of the Asiatic line in Gujarat or uh, banning the night traffic on roads passing through Bandipur across different parties in power uh, or uh, in Odisha, also the, uh, what Naveen Patnaik is doing with many of the reserves and so on. Um, and but yet you are seeing some new types of challenges, just like we had Green Revolution, we had other transformations of um, in large dams and so on. Now we have large infrastructure projects, um, which have uh, led to um, the, uh, the concerns over, over, uh, over ecological connectivity being disrupted across many places. Um, many conservationists and activists have used uh, the judiciary to actually uh, come up, it took 10 years for uh, mitigation measures to be put in place um, in, by the National Highways Authority of India. And now mitigation measures on, on highways and linear barriers are beginning to, to, uh, to, to become an issue where even those who promoted these highways are taking pride in the fact that uh, the, the uh, the, the underpasses and, and overpasses that are being built have actually allowed for passage of wildlife from one part of uh, the forest to the other and things like that. We have also had a history of giving up certain projects, whether it was the Silent Valley Dam, um, and there were a couple of other dams like the Moya Dam, which was also given up in the past. The Setu Samadram project for completely different set of reasons. Um, we have also had realignment of railway lines and roads and different parts of the and uh, so we are going to be seeing a very big uh, infrastructure push, which an escalation of human wildlife conflict, which is also emerging because uh, of changes in land use, and in some cases, possibly attributed to increase in population in certain source areas, which are then coming in conflict with the expansion of towns and villages and so on. So, um, so. So overall, I, I think that one has to be an optimist 
Um, and, and so I'm just wondering what, uh, what do you see as uh, our strengths because civil society organizations in India have, and government both have made, made huge contributions to, to conservation, uh, which is also quite remarkable compared to many other countries in Asia where conservation is often dominated by Western agencies. Uh, so that's another, I think, big strength that we have, the civil society contribution to conservation, natural history, and e ecological science. So this is just, uh, I mean, there are grounds for optimism, and that's my take on this. One of the premises of conservation, nature conservation in India, was to sequester areas from larger economic, social, cultural changes and let nature rebound and recover in these areas. To go back to the Deccan Herald editorial, very well-meaning one, it ended by saying forests should be protected and if they're well protected, there'll be lots of uh, trees, plants, herbs, grasses which the elephants can feed on and then they won't stray outside these areas. Very important words. See the elephant, tiger, and boar, bear, they have not got a house. Tonight, everybody in this room will go back and sleep in a house. You have an identified place. They don't have a residence. They have a home range. That home range shifts over time. And 60% of the home range of elephants in India is outside protected areas. Neither the first elephant task force 1990, nor the second elephant task force 2010, wanted that situation changed. You cannot increase the protected areas from 40% of elephant range to 100 because the level of human displacement conflict is unthinkable. What one has to do is to evolve ways to minimize the conflict situation between elephants and humans, either in the transit of elephants or in their feeding or when they kill people and they kill 600 people a year. That is, 50 people a month. That is four people plus per week. One every two days are killed by elephants. When the Elephant Task Force report came out, it was 400 per day. This, may, this is not because the elephants are more aggressive or that the people are getting in their way alone. The conditions and situations vary in different places. The flip side to this, over 100, 125 elephants are killed every year by people. Most are not killed for tusks, they are killed protecting crops. And it should be said to credit of all the state governments with elephant range, they have been trying to address this issue. But there's a problem. The elephant, administratively, is a forest department problem. The belief is that they are the forest department's elephants. By the way, the elephants don't think so. We don't know. It's very important. The second is that the popular belief, even in the bureaucratic political leadership, is that scientists know how to convince elephants to go back to the forest. I want to, this is very crucial. This is a situation of fluid shifting boundaries. The elephants and the people are in the same landscape. Chhattisgarh, which till 25 years ago had no elephants, has fatalities due to elephants in six districts. Tirupati district, which had never had elephants for decades, has a group of resident elephants. Chittur district. They are not going anywhere. They are there. So, what are the systems to protect the livelihood, life of the people, as well as the life of the elephants? It's, very, it's a very, very difficult question. It doesn't have a simple one-line answer. If you catch the elephants, let me assure you, there's nowhere to put them. Wherever you release them, they will go back. A lot of studies show this. If you want to keep them in captivity, you can calculate what it feed, costs to feed 1, 10, 20, 100 elephants. So there is a problem. And let me be clear, this is not a problem only of cultivators and elephants. It is a problem of the infrastructure development projects. Now, full uh, statement, I am associated with the Wildlife Trust of India. I'm just a trustee advisor. Wildlife Trust of India has been involved in voluntary relocation of groups of people in Wynad who were coming in conflict with elephants. In Kerala, it's been done in a law-governed fashion. But that is an exceptional situation. In other places, we may need to have better protection systems for the people. And we had suggested in the task force hearing, public hearing, 
with the forest revenue officials, elected representatives and MLA at the beginning of the sowing season, end of the harvest season, to address the issue of crop loss. It's a very serious issue. In 2010, it affected 500,000 people. That's a very large number of people, that's 5 lakh people. So I do think, while much of what you say is true, state governments, local people, uh, civil society, middle class help, and middle class should include middle class which doesn't speak English. Bulk of Indian middle class are people who speak Kannada, Tulu, Tamil, Hindi, Marathi, Kok Barak, and all languages. Very crucial. That, that all of them are crucial in this, in securing these animals. But in the coming period, we can't just secure the numbers and, and the animals. We also have to look at these questions. And I am a little hesitant. There is a very fine scholar, leading Indian tiger biologist. His book is just out, Among Tigers, Dr. Karant. He has suggested in his book, India should expand the area for tiger conservation from 80,000 to 380,000 square kilometers. In these areas, there should be voluntary relocation. And in other areas, we can't have tigers. Tigers and people have to be separated. Now, I'm not sure if this sharp separation model will ever work in India. This may work in countries like South Africa, which have a history of appetite. I, I'm firstly not sure it'll work. And second, I'm not sure it's justifiable or defensible. Sociologically, I can't debate about the tiger elephant behavior. You know, your other point on pessimism, I agree. I think pessimism is built into many ideas of conservation. Conservation biology, according to Michael Sule, the great professor who defined it among the first people, he said it's a band-aid science. So when you're playing hockey, you, you, you get hurt, you put some band-aid. But as you know, that's not an answer to all problems. That only works if you've injured your knee playing. What if you've twisted your ankle? What if you broke a leg? So the simple quick answer is conservation may be a band-aid solution. But environmental problems are not just identifiable through decisive immediate action. Decisive immediate action always makes great headlines. And it, it does have its place. The end of safari hunting, tiger poaching, export of tiger skins, creation of tiger reserves, undoubtedly helped secure the species and its habitats from extinction. 50 years later, we should say that. It also helped work out a certain model of preservation which it was expanded from 9, 10 to 50 reserves. Having said that, it sowed the seeds of later crisis. One of the crises is the deep alienation of people living within and around those reserves. The other is that strict protection without sound science and protection and science informing each other has not been very strongly evident in much of the Indian cases. Third, it is still a model of sequestration, not realizing the larger landscape is changing. So I think this Gordian knot business of, you know, decisive action and all is very good. But we need careful thinking, cooperative ways of approaching. And these crises, you know, one of the commonalities to the Green Revolution, the Big Dam and wildlife preservation is, uh, Charles C. Mann wrote a remarkable book called The Wizard and the Prophet. And uh, there is a couple of reviews which summarize the book. You can read the review. The book is a big fat book. Nowadays people don't want to read books, but I think they're worth reading. But anyway. So he argued there are two ways in which these two very important American scientists approached the problem of nature in the 40s. Norman Bollock said, you got to apply technology and solve the problem of production. That's the only way to handle hunger. Norman Bollock was a working class white. He worked in Mexico. There's something very important in him winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. It was about hunger, but it also helped save land from agricultural expansion. It's very important. Once you intensify production in one unit area, you don't have to clear five unit areas. It should be obvious historically, but often isn't. The other was his exact opposite. William Walked, who Charles Mann calls the prophet. So the wizard has this bond, technology, application. The other says no. We have to have balance. And he had studied the guano birds of, uh, you know, the islands of uh, Latin America. And he argued you have to moderate the way humans behave with nature. I would argue that India is a country which celebrates prophets, but follows the wizard. Have no illusions. Power, and this is not only India, this is true of different political systems. And at one level, at one level, we can all see why. See, we are still in a world where the bulk of the GDP is still in a handful of countries, despite the rise of China, 
despite the rise of India. One European consumes in one month as much power as an Indian does in a year. This, it's, 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 you know, when you, when you, when you read this, it hits you. All right. So we see that, but this requires a very different application. This wizard profit debate will continue forever. We would require a combination of science or knowledge, citizen, and the community of the producer. It's very important. The people actually doing it, the people milking the cow, you know, raising the sheep and goats, all this wonderful work of Center for Pastoralism, the fishers, the fascinating work on fisher systems of management, my distinguished colleague in Ashoka, Dr. Divya Karnad. That has to come in. And were that to come in, we would then be in a more stable base beyond crisis management. Our issue is in crisis. What happens when there are not 1.4 but 1.8 billion people on this landscape? The land, water, soil, atmospheric systems have to be intact. That requires a different form of material flows. It also requires the living organisms around us. They are vital to keep it habitable. So these are interrelated. And I don't think that the earlier systems, they had a glimmer of it. And I completely agree with you. The extreme view is because conservation is seen as, uh, you know, as Dr. Rohanatha said, the view from the trenches. The long arc of history is about more than the trenches. There's much more to life than the trenches. The guys in the trenches went home after the battle, no? Life went on. Peace did come back. But that search for peace should involve more than wizardry and these sharp interventions, which, by the way, I think governments, Asian governments are good at it, and Indian governments are especially good at it. But this may require a very different bundle of long-term engagements and interventions. Sorry. Uh, as we are here, uh, COP15 is going on, and uh, one of the goals set uh, there is having 30% of our land and water uh, under some form of biodiversity-friendly management. Um, so obviously, this, these cannot be protected areas because we have seen the limitations of, uh, of protected areas. Uh, and the only way 30% of India's land and waters can be in, in some form of biodiversity-friendly management is with the linkages with these larger issues of productivity of land, the health of, of a soil, water, um, and also jobs related to these, as well as other goals that we have, like the restoration of 26 million hectares of degraded land that the government of India has set. Um, unless we are able to connect these dots, uh, it would be, I would say, very difficult for us to achieve those lofty goals of having 30% of the country. Um, but this is a uh, but this is, this is something that I think will uh, uh, need uh, all the things that you have mentioned uh, and some reimagination of, of, uh, of how we are connected with our land and water in terms of our development choices. So it is going to be in a very challenging next few decades which will in some sense determine all of this. Um, I think we will now uh, take questions uh, from the audience, uh, both uh, here as well as uh, online. Yeah, please identify yourself and uh, please go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Rohit and uh, I'm an engineer actually. I just uh, visited IHS because of the library and stuff, so I got to know the event. Um, and you spoke so about such a wide range of issues. Uh, I have so many topics to talk about, but uh, one question immediately was about, uh, India still comes out with a wasteland atlas, uh, which uh, it's funny that it's a colonial thing that you call some uh, lands as wasteland. So uh, what do you think about that? And also, because you spoke about agriculture, I don't know if it's relevant to today's topic, but what do you think about the farm laws and the protests and uh, the effect of that on agriculture? We can take a couple of more. Yeah. Hi, hi, Mahesh. I am Ajay Gautam. I am postdoc fellow at IHS. It was a really very fascinating presentation. I really, it was good, good in a sense that that you have started from 1890 and ended at two, uh, 2013 with the Land Acquisition Act. And uh, land acquisition is something which I am working on. So I have a very direct question: whether it is land acquisition policies or any environmental related policies. Uh, would you see that the role of uh, new liberal agenda, which we see, what kind of impact these things that, ha uh, that these policies have or agendas are, uh, have, 
because we have seen recently there have been papers there have been uh, you know economists you know they are talking about that how neoliberal agenda are actually detrimental to 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 the development of the marginalized section which you have mentioned you know uh, even in your presentation so this is this is the only question please please give your views on it thank you question from manisha madapati you said one should look 10 years in the past for reason for any kind of big event that precipitates in what ways can we think about the covid 19 at this point or a time in the future what are some of the tangents of history that one can interrogate within the ambit of history of nature so the last is a very fascinating question how does one understand tangents of history interpretively from the history of nature well there's more to the history of nature than nature whatever you mean by nature as raymond williams said is a profoundly human idea our idea of nature whether it it is under threat whether it is a basket of resources whether it should be studied in order to protect it whether it should be studied in order to exploit it will have a lot to do with how we read history and one of the larger insights would be that the historical discipline largely focused over last 100 odd years on how humans relate to each other nature was seen as a backdrop it's not a backdrop it's part of the story and i will refer you to remarkable work by my friend professor arup jyoti saikya unquiet river so 2000 year history of the river brahmaputra in assam well the last 200 years it gets very exciting so much of the book is not on 2000 years but it reminds you that you need to take a longer view even when you're looking at something immediate and one of the deep insights in the book is that the brahmaputra in terms of sheer volume of water has no equal in south asia there's lots of water in the brahmaputra and if you try to build embankments of the sort being attempted over the last 50 80 100 years you'll fail this doesn't mean you never build them but you think really hard before you build them now this may seem like something common place but i think that one of the ideas of the histories of nature is that it will breed some humility in looking at natural phenomena we did go through a period in the 20th century when it was thought that technology could master nature i think broadly this would be something most practitioners of history of the environment would agree on we disagree on almost everything else what are the implications of a 5 trillion dollar economy honestly you have answered that question that depends on what the components of that economy are so one of the big debates in the discipline of economics historically was who could bake a bigger cake faster how the way you divided the cake mattered if you baked a bigger cake would it automatically divide up equally because the market was more efficient as a distributor of goodies in this case cake i mean you can change it you can make it a giant laddu or whatever the other was that the manner of distribution has a lot to do with the size of the cake that if you distribute it more equally you will also end up producing a bigger cake because there will be greater incentive and whether you do that through legal regulation cooperatives or you have a big revolution these are the big debates my sense is that as you rightly say there is a deep worry not only in india but in many countries that linkages to a global market exposes you to price fluctuations internationally those price fluctuations can undermine the viability of local producers so in 1860 to 65 the united states fought the first one of the first modern industrialized wars there were railways there were modern weapons and lots of americans killed each other and the union won for those 5 years there was no cotton exported from the american south to the mills of manchester the cotton came from western india 
Michelle McAlpin has shown there is a correlation between clearance of land, not forest, but scrub and savanna in Western India, and the cotton boom. The boom of cotton prices fueled the expansion of cotton, the collapse of cotton prices because the Americans did end the Civil War, the North won, they, they, put, they, they freed the slaves and the cotton plantations resumed and cotton supplies resumed. But I think we should be a little careful here because you can't turn the clock black on the process of globalization. Now when we wrote this, my very distinguished friend Ashish Kotari, he has co-authored a very fine book, Churning the Earth, he wrote a letter, how can you say this, people overthrow feudalism, imperialism, I agree. But there's a difference between overthrowing a power structure and dealing with the process. I want to provide a very interesting exhibit, the island of Cuba. The Cuba staged a revolution in 1958. And Cuba, under the very charismatic guerrilla leader, even people who don't, don't know who he was, love to get that photograph because he's such a handsome man, Che Guevara. So Che Guevara, as Minister of Industry, tried to make the Cuban economy not dependent on sugar. The Cuban economy was developed a sugar economy with slavery under the Spanish and after it became independent by large American companies whose land was taken over by the Cubans. Very soon they came to a very unfortunate conclusion. In the world of nation states, Cuba had to export sugar. Of course, the United States was replaced by the Soviet Union and in 1991 the Soviet Union collapsed. So the very interesting work, Dr. Sedeloff, uh, who's a Swedish scholar, he did his doctorate in um, the UK, his book is coming out, Eco-Socialism in Cuba shows, Cuba in this 30 years has undertaken the largest government-driven promotion of organic agriculture. And by the way, they have tried to integrate to the world economy by exporting to countries other than the United States. It's not this disastrous, quick fix Sri Lankan way which led to Major crisis for the Sri Lankan economy, overnight. To it's not that way. It's done very carefully with a lot of thinking and Cuba has developed very good sciences. So, in the Cuban model, they have tried to do the organic way without giving up the other way. Therefore, whether India can emerge in a manufacturing power or not, I'm not an economist. I'm not qualified to say that. But definitely India can and develop and should develop a large home market. Many Indians who are producers barely consume anything because their income is not large enough. This is one of the few things everybody agrees on in India. Now, how to boost their income is the big issue. And I think it's related to Dr. Krishna Swami's uh, observation that if there were ways of expanding production, increasing production, including manufacture, without depleting the groundwater so fast, without destroying the soil nutrients, keeping the biomass intact, that is essential today. It's easy to say we shouldn't do manufacture, but this land can only support so many people with production. And some production would be domestic, some would be for export, how much, where, how, I leave it to economists, it's beyond my area. But I can't see going back to an autarchic economy. And by the way, no country is trying that, perhaps North Korea. Um, please note, a very important country in Asian history was Vietnam. We fought a big war on the Americans. Vietnam today has a per capita income 60% higher than India's. 60% higher. But they have very high production of rice and pepper. They've put in a lot of manufacturing. They've also got some of the largest ecological re regeneration projects in the developed world. And I, I don't want to just cite, uh, you know, Vietnam and Cuba. I can cite a third very unusual country, France. You know, France, it's a remarkable book, The Light Green Economy, Michael Best shows. In the last 40, 50 years, the French drawing on the European Union have protected French agriculture in such a way that, that France has protected a lot of its ecological diversity on the farm, among the livestock and the wetlands and the forests. But it has done so with a large program of indigenous production, 70% of its power is nuclear. It cut down fossil fuels. So my sense is that whatever mix we come up with, we'll keep debating them, it will be a mix of intelligent choices which are contra which, which may look contradictory in nature. So I don't see any easy quick fix. Your question, sir, is very important, land acquisition and the neoliberal agenda. But land acquisition, uh, without the neoliberal agenda, between 1950 and 80, led to the displacement of not less than 20 million people with large dam projects. 
large dam projects were part of the developmentless project of the independent states. In Nehru's India and others, after Nehru, there have been lots of other prime ministers. He died 50, what is it, almost 60 years ago. Uh, Nasser's uh, Aswan Dam, uh, the great uh, Atatürk Dam of Turkey. So there are deeper roots. The, the, the problem can be defined very differently. You use the term liberal or neoliberal. Liberalism arose in imperial countries. Ajay Mehta's famous book was titled Liberalism's Empire. They were liberal within and imperial without and there's a big question mark how liberal were they within? Gender, class, race, etc. But to come back, how does liberalism work in a society where most people do not have property rights? It's a very simple question. It's not complicated. So, securing property rights is very important for a democracy. We may believe in collectivism, communism, socialism, radicalism, anarchism, capitalism, whatever we believe in, all of us want to have some property. Why? Because it gives you a sense of security. And with land, therefore, all these measures of different governments to, you know, digitize the land record, amortize, it's actually very, very important. So, these are labels. I, I, I have my doubts. So, one is property. The second is a more serious question. The, in a country where so many people are small producers, what is there to protect them against adversity of the market, which now may be related to extreme events, such as floods, drought, etc. And I think we will all broadly agree that unlike Western European countries, market economy, post Second World War, which constructed social safety welfare nets. This was never done in India. It never been done. It's, it has been attempted by many governments. And I think all government attempts of this are very positive. We should think of how to have even better safety nets, which are wider and stronger. How do you secure the basic producer? And this is a problem, that 45%, who's going to subsidize it? And where? But I think it's in the larger interest of the body politic and an enlightened society to do that. One of the ways to do that is just to secure prices of their products. But then it's to ensure them a market. So then we are again looking at cooperation in production for marketing, if not for pooling resources for production. I completely agree with you. So this notion of wasteland comes from the old land revenue settlements, which divided the land into cultivated land and waste. The waste was further subdivided into culturable waste and unculturable. Culturable means you can plow it up. Unculturable means good for nothing. However, as you rightly point out, 45% of India, 40-45% is arid or semi-arid. Many of these lands, far from being wasteland, are highly productive, certainly in terms of animal husbandry. They are also ecologically very significant, not only for carbon sequestration or biological diversity, but for their impact on the soil and the water. And definitely this needs to be rethought. Farm laws and impact on agriculture comes to the uh, other question. The most sustained resistance to farm laws came in the areas which were the homeland of Green Revolution, West UP, Punjab and Haryana. But in Punjab and Haryana, this is one of the first areas in India where government, going back to 1930s, worked with cultivators, including large cultivators, to secure manner of marketing of farm produce, which would try to get a better deal for the cultivator, not ideal. But the APMCs which were set up in these areas due to the efforts of the great unionist Sir Choturam, today have a lot of legitimacy in these areas. They are not without flaws, but they have also undergone a lot of changes. And the kind of resistance was also because of distrust, not so much of the government, but possibly of large private players who are not regarded with trust by the cultivators. I mean, it comes down to that. And to be fair, government in a democracy sometimes goes ahead with measures. They look at the popular pulse and they step back. Now, we can debate whether they should have stepped back six months before, one month before, one year before, but they did. And there's a, there's a very interesting parallel. Under Mrs. Indira Gandhi, uh, 1973, they nationalized the grain trade. The chief ministers of Punjab, Haryana, UP, who were from her party, publicly said this will be a disaster, it will be a failure. 
Union government overruled them. After many months, it ate crow. There's nothing wrong with saying we made a mistake, we stepped back. I see it as a mature decision. This is not a party political issue. And I think that in a different world, we can have a debate on farm laws. We may need better farm laws, but these laws should be enacted by the state assemblies, maybe acting with each other in concert. So if you see the GST with all its faults, it's been done through discussion and debate across the states. Similarly, that should be the case here. But I think with agriculture, there's a peculiar problem, which is, uh, to quote uh, Professor Swaminathan, he said this years ago, but it's a brilliant quote, it's a very scary quote. He said earlier we were, we were dependent on magic of monsoon. Now we are dependent on magic of market. You know the problem with magic in real life? Sometimes it doesn't work. That was true with the monsoon. It's true with the market. And I think that that is a question which Indian political system, social system has to seriously address. And uh, I think you see it in, in every uh, part of the world. And I again come back, it's built into Indian democratic politics. Most of the Indians are not only consumers, they're producers. What are they producing and what are they getting for that? And what enablement is there for their production? How can that be environmentally benign? That is the way we can reframe the question. And I think this is, this is happening. You know, the state I live in, or rather work in Haryana, gets sort of bad press, but something people do not realize is, Haryana brought in law to change the time of sowing in order to protect the groundwater. That had the unintended effect that it increased double burning, but it has protected the groundwater. Haryana has made very serious efforts to incentivize farmers moving from paddy to other crops. It's not by forcing them. There's no point. I mean, they are going to look at the market the way a stockbroker does, the way every one of us calculates, you know, the interest on our credit card bill. They're also part of the modern world. Uh, they can do mental arithmetic better than people in the best schools in Bangalore or Delhi because their life depends on it. They can do it in multiple figures without a calculator or pen and, pen and paper. Even people who are not literate can do it. So, you know, there has to be a different way of looking at the environment with the producer at the center. Now, this will require a complete rethinking. But there is a lot of positive work on this. I think there, are, there is a cooperative tradition, there's a tradition of self-help, there's a tradition of small cultivator, and one of the very interesting features we found is people have looked also at the landless labor, uh, what role they can play. So we need conservation as if people mattered. Environmental repair as if the producer mattered, including the small and medium. They're very critical, they're the bulk. In numbers, they're very large, and they, they're, they're voters and actors, and they're also citizens. So can we have citizenship as if the environment mattered? Mithles, so it was really wonderful the way you connected political science, sociology and economics. I have two comments. One is that in entire whatever you said, I think you missed somewhere the role of entire forest department. I think last year I was in Jharkhand at the same time and I get a chance to interact with different people who are either involved in the implementation of FRA in Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, and the way they express their feeling that the amount of destruction forest has is more due to the forest department. And I think you, I think, missed, or is it right to interpret in that way or not? And second, about this whole debate about the and want, is there any uh, policy maker or, or whoever is taking decision, is there any about that, that or something as you mentioned the philosophy of Gandhi and other is there consideration of these things uh, Mayesh, I'm going to read uh, um, one more question online yeah. uh, Deepti and uh, she uh, lives in Auroville both the wizards and the prophets are influenced by narratives and both would have enough to argue that their perspective of science knowledge and community is the one to follow are there lessons we could pick from history? So the person I think is very interesting is uh, Karl Marx as philosopher and thinker. Uh, not as ideologue necessarily, but as good German philosopher, he was playing game and his daughters put, what is your favorite maxim? And he said, doubt everything. And he's absolutely right, including Marx. He also said that when he saw what is done in name of Marxism, 
he felt that he dis, dis, detested or despised it, one of those terms. So I think doubt everything. We have to doubt everything. That doesn't mean just doubt. The questioning should come with some creative engagement. So of course, uh, these are ideologues. Each will say that all the events are fitting my narrative. But history doesn't offer any lessons. It can't. If it did, the person who got them right would master the future. One of the wonderful things about humans is that they defy mastery by any one idea or person. And that's good. That's how it should be. So I think that uh, if we doubt everything, if we have debate, and if the debates uh, are creative, we will find ways. There won't be one. Uh, it, this prophet wizard are, uh, they're just, uh, you know, ideal types to set up. There's a range of choices between the prophet and the wizard. And there are choices beyond the prophets and the wizards. I mean, by the way, he did pick two very important alpha males of American science in the mid 20th century because it's long enough ago. You know, we can get a sense of perspective. You pick two other people, you may get a very different story. No, I agree with Mithlishji. The first department is very important. And in fact, I did try to argue that the tenural reforms which have taken place in the cultivated space have not taken place in the forest department space. And uh, those of us who have worked on its history, but many others who have worked on contemporary forestry, I would cite two very fine scholars. Uh, N.C. Saxena, his very fine work on farm forestry, where he showed that the government is not enabling farm forestry. It is not assisting the cultivator as producer of tree wealth. It's trying to put too many barriers on them. And his other flip was important. He argued that the government-owned lands should focus on livelihood issues, livelihood generation, not cash generation. And famously, he argued that the tree, the trunk, may not be as important as the crown. And he gave instances which you will be very familiar with of Mahua and Tendu and others. Uh, I think there is an issue with the FRA because the implementation of FRA is done by forest department and tribal department. Forest department is the department which was entrusted with the curtailment of rights, the mobilization of labor to harness the forest for economic production. The history of this department runs counter to the agenda that it should protect, regenerate, renew. Now, there is a change because of the 1996 Godavarman case. Many forest departments have given up silvicultural operations. They've given up the one thing they did for years, right or wrong. And a big change in them is because of the Forest Conservation Act and the way land has been handed over over the last, since around 2010-12, larger and larger chunks of land for non-forest use. That land through Kampa goes to the forest department. So it's actually, strangely, benefiting departmentally from the de-reservation of forest land without actually being able to account for the regeneration of biomass. So there has to be a complete change and we can debate the ways it can and should be restructured. COVID is very important, ma'am. I think the pandemic of 2020 had remarkable parallels and contrasts with the pandemic of 100 years ago. On the positive side, as Professor David Arnold wrote in the book Epidemics in Asia, uh, the mortalities were controlled. There was an ability to provide palliative, remedial care, and there was ability to distribute the vaccine. Having said that, it is a fact that the larger enormous deficiencies in the health system, particularly the shortage of hospitals, nurses, doctors, vital equipment, was felt the most in those regions and areas which have invested the least in them. You can contrast uh, particular states in South India, Western India, with particular states in North India, East India, and all those lags in the human dimension of development came to the fore. They also came to the fore in the other part, which is because so many Indians are basic producers and wage workers, how do you secure their living? Here there's a very interesting double point. Lot of work has been done by journalists, policy people to show the gaps, the shortfalls, the enormous human suffering. And <coughs> I'm sure that over time, 
those need to be absorbed. I mean, why did so many laborers have to walk all the way home? And uh, it's very galling to see parallels with the 1920s. But on the plus side, and I must say this, the ability of government to deliver food, I forget the exact figure, 800 million, 800 crime, not only grain, but please note pulses for one, one and a half years, was enabled by the Green Revolution. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been there. Imagine India <coughs> being where sub-Saharan African countries are now, having to import the grain. But the other parts are very crucial. But uh, <coughs> in the environmental front, ma'am, COVID is a reminder that pandemics are here to stay. And if you look at WHO report 2012, if you look at the writings of David Kwamen and several others, there will be such episodes. By the way, there have been eight since 2000. I challenge anyone here to tell me the names of eight. I'm not sure I can tell you all. I can tell you, I think, more than four. And all of them have a common feature, which is that these organisms which inhabit the human body and the bodies of other organisms, their ability to make the jump has increased. And it's increased because humans are more in contact with each other. So you go back to the Great War, 1914 to 18. The war enabled the spread of the so-called Spanish flu. Just as in the past, wars enabled the spread of the plague from Central Asia into Europe. So what does history show? It shows where there is war, where there is more commerce, where there is more interchange, you'll have stowaways. In case of the plague, the stowaway was the black rat. In case of COVID-19, it was the virus itself. So when we think of environment, we should include the human body, because the human body, as E.O. Wilson famously remind us, reminds us, every student who reads this sentence comes and says they're in a state of shock, that under, your eyelash, under eyelashes of humans, there are 14 species of mites, M-I-T-E-S. They live there. They're there right now. I was very scary, but it isn't. It shouldn't be. You know, this idea that humans are apart from the ecological system is belied by our history. Think of the 20th century in this subcontinent. Malaria, plague, cholera, smallpox, COVID-19, Spanish flu, six. We can go on. All of these show that the human environment, the health of the human body, the health of the surroundings requires even more attention now than before. We are in a much more challenging, changing world. We also have the ability to make the interventions, to come in with the changes. And I think, again, that cooperation is very critical. You know, this can't be done by one country. And, and I must say that the ability of countries to cooperate was remarkable, but the gaps are equally important. The number of people who have struggled to get to the vaccine across the world, particularly Africa. It, it's very galling. And again, within India, we can look at states and regions which were able to achieve this far better. And I think it comes back to that citizen being at the center and, you know, that Gandhian notion of putting the last first. By any stretch, even those who think India did a great job will agree it could have done a far better job. And of course, there are many people who feel we didn't do a great job. But as a student of history, the fascinating thing about the pandemic is that everyone was taken by surprise by it. Why? So why are we not paying attention to this? And I come back, uh, unusually, in 2012 WHA report, uh, two American presidents who actually followed this closely. You'll be surprised with Ebola was Bush, but the other was Clinton. So there the United States came in very fast. There were strategic reasons. It wanted to do something very fast in Western Africa, and to be fair, it also cooperated with the WHO. So cooperation across countries and within, and building those safety nets is important, but being aware of environmental change in the larger sense, that habitable safe world is not only safe for the tiger and you know, the mud skipper and uh, uh, snow leopard, it's also for humans.